Alright, what's up boys? Today we're talking about art history. So, you know how art and art history can be quite esoteric, right? There's a thousand different words, probably Italian or French, different time periods, different art styles, different artists, different masters, different aesthetics. And if you're not really into art, you just wouldn't really know them. And that's fine, you don't really need to know any of these to enjoy art. But, do you ever catch yourself in an art museum staring at a painting of a big red square and going, hmm, this painting really do be made of paint. <laughs> But if that's you and you're interested in learning about art, well, I mean, you could probably just read a book, but if you really have to learn art by watching someone paint Garfield in the specific style you're learning about, well, I guess you came to the right place. <laughs> well, that, and I mean, I'm both out of shelf space and ideas for curse sculptures, so... Anyways, the first episode is on Tenebrism and the Italian artist who pioneered it, Caravaggio. So, before we talk about Tenebrism, let's talk about realism. Like that one time my dentist told me I grind my sleep. Now that shit was real. <laughs> when we talk about realism in art, we've got to talk about the Italian Renaissance. This was a time when Da Vinci was painting the Mona Lisa, Michelangelo was sculpting David, and Raphael was painting the School of Athens. So naturally, when people think realism and representational painting, their mind immediately goes to this period. But, you know, it's also worth considering that art during this period was being used as propaganda and the Christian church was pushing art to represent natural beauty. And because of that, the most prevalent form of art during the High Renaissance was only portraying the most idealized version of reality. And, you know, even in the late 16th century, that shit got really old really fast. But that's where our boy Caravaggio and his tenebrism comes in. So, what is tenebrism, I hear you ask in my own head as I imagine things. Uh, well, in art, there's this term chiaroscuro, which generally refers to an artist's control of light to achieve dramatic contrast and shadow. And to demonstrate better with an example, right, I've taken a random object that's in my room that I don't know yet, and I've taken two pictures of it. And despite the fact that it's the same object with the exact same composition, one appears much more dramatic than the other. This is because through differences in lighting and post-production, I've given one picture a much higher chiaroscuro. And Tenorism is just Kiroscuro's darker and edgier cousin. So, in Kiroscuro, Shadow is an important side character, right? It plays a role in the artist's decision, but in Tenorism, darkness acts more like an entire stage. Oftentimes, in Tenorism, the background is entirely black, or it's almost entirely black, and everything that isn't in a shadow is given an increased sense of importance because it's more apparent that the artist has specifically placed it there. And is this lighting technique and aesthetic decision that put Caravaggio in the pages of art history books. Even though Caravaggio didn't necessarily invent painting your paintings a bit darker, he was the first to dedicate his entire portfolio to painting tenebrism. And his usage of tenebrism was so successful and influential that, well, these are the before and after photos of the art world. And honestly, without this man, the usage of shadows as an important dramatic device might have started a lot later, and the masters of the Baroque era might have been painting things that looked a lot different without his influence. Honestly, even in the modern day, we still see his tenebrism in things like low-key lighting in films, like in this shot from The Godfather, or this one from Parasite, or the Fast and Furious X movie poster, or in any media that uses shadow as a dramatic device. And that could honestly be the end of the video, but luckily for us, since I still haven't finished painting Garfield, his life was as dramatic as his paintings. So let's start from the beginning. In 1751, and that's not even right, is it? In 1571, Caravaggio was born at a very young age. <laughs> he was originally named Michelangelo Marisi, but he would later assume the name of his hometown. While he was still young, many of his family, including his father, would die of the plague. At around 12 years old, Caravaggio would start an apprenticeship at a painting studio in Milan. But since the studio taught mainly frescoes, which generally look like this, and his work looked like this, and he painted on canvas, I assume he didn't pay that much attention. But around this time, Caravaggio was learning fencing, and art historians speculate that Caravaggio might have been bi or gay. So instead of mastering frescoes, Caravaggio might have been learning to master two different types of swords. <laughs> and this detail will become important later, but for now, Caravaggio is improving his fundamentals as a painter while in Milan. He was also likely becoming more influenced by Christian theology, and if he had seen in person, the Martyrdom of St. Lawrence by Titian would have likely sparked an early interest in tenebrism for young Caravaggio. He might have also been bitten by lizard, which I can't confirm is important to his growth as an artist, 
but I do think it's a cool painting, which might have been a self-portrait. Then, at the age of 21 in 1592, he killed a police officer, or maybe he didn't. We don't know the details, but he did leave Milan for Rome after a dispute involving the murder of a police officer. Caravaggio would arrive in Rome penniless. Luckily for him, the, <laughs> luckily for him, the Christian girlies were fighting and Catholicism needed a new art movement to act as propaganda to counter the growth of the Protestant church. This movement was called the Counter-Reformation, and as new churches and religious buildings were being built, the Catholic Church would need a new art style to replace mannerism. But Caravaggio wasn't just going to be a cog in the propaganda machine. He was going to be the cog that defined Catholic propaganda for the entire decade. In Rome, he would meet the artist Miniti, who would introduce Caravaggio to street brawls and later become a model for many of his paintings. He was also speculated to be one of Caravaggio's lovers. And as he settled down in Rome, Caravaggio would grow his circle of friends, many of whom were his artistic peers who took direct inspiration from his use of tenorism. These artists and others who followed his style were called the Caravaggisti. Among them were Miniti, Baglioni, and Aurelio Gentileschi, who, by the way, is the father of Artemisia Gentileschi, also a Caravaggisti who painted my personal favorite painting, Judith Slaying Holofernes. That shit goes so fucking hard. And as Caravaggio developed his style, he would quickly grow to fame. Increasingly, he was becoming known as the artist who hasn't just mastered chiaroscuro, but one who makes it a dominant character of his painting. He would also become known for his unusual practice of using commoners as subjects and models for his paintings. It was this practice alongside his tenorism that would make him the most famous artist in Rome. One that would paint reality the way the human eye sees it and not in a calculated manner that would idealize the world like those of the High Renaissance. This made Caravaggio uniquely suited to portraying Jesus Christ as a humble man, and this ability during the Counter-Reformation would make Caravaggio the most sought-after artist by those in power. Caravaggio's fame in Rome would peak around 1602, but as he grew in fame, he would also become subject to many scandals. His usage of commoners in religious paintings was considered too vulgar for many, and, as alluded to earlier, Caravaggio would become scrutinized for his sexuality. See, other than the men in his paintings being a little too sexy, art historians also make assumptions of Caravaggio's sexuality based upon accusation levied against him by his contemporaries. One such accusation comes from one of my favorite episodes of Caravaggio's life. In 1603, an artist by the name of Baglioni litigated Caravaggio for defamation. See, despite being quite critical of Caravaggio's painting methods, Baglioni still took a lot of inspiration from Caravaggio's tenebrism, and according to the court documents from the litigations, Caravaggio and his circle of Caravaggeses had been distributing unflattering poetry about Baglioni's artwork, claiming that Baglioni was copying his style. <laughs> Imagine having a diss track written about you in the 16th century. <laughs> Anyways, in Baglioni's accusation, he claims the poetry was distributed by a male prostitute whom Caravaggio had shared with his friend. Y you know, a very classic night of the boys. <laughs> Beyond this, it is also speculated that Baglioni's most famous painting, the one that started this whole drama, is painted to accuse Caravaggio of sodomy. In the sacred and profane love, it is believed that Baglioni is portraying Caravaggio laying with the profane love, while the sacred love stands in between as if to punish them. And while the accusations of homosexuality was never followed upon due to Caravaggio's high status, Caravaggio was found guilty of defamation because, well, he didn't really even try to defend himself of the crime. In fact, because of this trial, we do have one of the few documented opinions made by Caravaggio about his contemporaries. Caravaggio went on record to say how little thinks of Baglioni's artwork and basically saying that, Your Honor, I'm not guilty of defamation because his artwork deserved insults. He did end up going to prison for two weeks after this, but personally I think it was worth it, you know, to make your greatest hater seat and mold for the rest of his life. In fact, Baglioni was so angry that he became Caravaggio's first biographer after Caravaggio died. And even to this day, the sacred and the profane love is still Baglioni's most famous painting. Typical Caravaggio dub. But this was just one of Caravaggio's many legal troubles. And just to list a few, you know, aside from the police murder mentioned earlier, he went in and out of jail repeatedly for numerous street brawls. He also beat up a nobleman with a club. He was arrested for possessing legal weapons. Uh, he was sued for not paying rent on time and drilling holes in the walls to light up his models. <laughs> in response to which, he threw rocks at his landlady's windows, getting him sued again. This man was just in and out of jail constantly. 
so often that I'm surprised he finished any paintings. Luckily for the art world, I guess, he was just also built different. He was known to finish entire heads in a single day, and probably entire paintings in just a few weeks, leaving him plenty of time to speed around getting arrested again. But soon, legal troubles would catch up with him, when he inevitably killed someone in one of his fights. In 1606, after spending 14 years living in Rome, the now 34 years old artist left a city that had made him the most famous artist in the late Renaissance era, and he would spend the rest of his life running from the law. Now, with murder charges from two different cities, he would once again be on the run and moving through Italy. But even with his life sentence, he was still getting commissions from Rome, and Caravaggio would continue to paint them in his usual tenorism, but this time with even more somber tones, reflecting his guilt and a desire for a pardon from both God and the Church. One example of a painting from this period is David with the head of Goliath, where Caravaggio portrays his own portrait on the head of Goliath in a display of personal regret and sorrow. Eventually, he would move to Malta to join the Knights of St. John, and by enlisting, he did get his pardon. An event that he immortalized in a painting. In the only painting that Caravaggio ever signed, he painted his own name flowing out of St. John's neck, signifying that through the sacrifice of his patron saint, Caravaggio was reborn again as a Knight of Malta, and forgiven for his past sins. Well, well, well until he got himself arrested again. <laughs> Just before the unveiling of this painting, Caravaggio shot a scene a night with a pistol and landed himself in prison. This time, he would escape from jail by climbing down a cliff, and once again, Caravaggio would be on the run from the law. <laughs> and as he's done pretty much all his life, he painted even more paintings where he was extremely sorry and regretful. <laughs> However, this time Caravaggio's paintings had an added twist in that Either from lead poisoning or from a wound he suffered in a fight, Caravaggio's hand tremors were starting to show. And towards the end of his life, he would attempt to travel back to Rome to present the paintings he had made as a gift, begging for a pardon. However, before he ever reached the city he had called home, Caravaggio would die, killed likely by the two things that had defined him, from a wound sustained in a fight, or from lead poisoning, likely sustained from one of his most important pigments, lead white. At the age of 38 in 1610, Caravaggio died in Naples, leaving behind a body of work that would go on to inspire an entire era of art that lasted nearly a century. So that's Caravaggio. He was probably one of the most influential artists of the Renaissance era alongside, you know, Da Vinci and Michelangelo, no big deal. In art history, he's usually seen as a bridge between the Renaissance and the Baroque era paintings. And, you know, Baroque paintings would continue to use his lighting style for at least a century. Even beyond paintings, we see his lighting effect in theatre, photography, and of course, cinema. He wasn't by any means the only artist who used tenebrism effectively. And, you know, I wouldn't even say he's the best at it. Of course, that is subjective. My personal favourite painting that uses heavy tenebrism is um, Judith Slaying Holofernes by Artemisia Tintoreschi, who is a stylistic student of Caravaggio. If you're interested in art history and want to learn more about this painting and painter, you should check out Great Art Explained. I will link their video um, right here, I think, if I know how to do that. But, you know, to get back to my point, what's important in art history isn't how good a painting is subjectively. What's more important is how influential an artist or an artwork was to the following generations. And, you know, by that metric, Caravaggio is measurably one of the greatest artists of all time. <laughs> Can you tell I'm a fan? Uh, anyways, that's the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, I would appreciate a uh, like, a subscribe, a comment, uh, hitting the share button. I heard that's good for the metrics. Anyways, thank you!